Okay. Well, Good thank job. you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, I wanted to discuss very quickly about some native tree choices. Um, these are kind of, I, I call this interesting choices for the home landscape because they sort of disappeared, um, replaced by other items that may have been kind of uh, uh, poorly misrepresented. So I first saw this photograph back, I think it was 2015. So let's say, if, you know, 112 years ago, the Long Island Expressway. I'm sure that car managed to get into a car accident, snarl up traffic for hours or hit a pothole or something. Um, but this kind of shows we started to fragment Long Island from each other and take away some wild places. Um, Long Island was home to the largest grassland east of the Mississippi and then suburbia, the birthplace of suburbia, the Levitt Houses. This was the post-world, uh, the post-war dream of for New York State, returning GIs, starting families, and we created this tract housing, and it was a good thing, but what did we replace what was torn up with? Lawn. Uh, still under the influence of seed catalogs from England and France, nothing spelled not, not only say luxury or you know prestige as a nice lush carpet of green lawn. So with lawn and, and another uh, byproduct of World War II was the Scotts Company brought up all the surplus chemicals to create a fertilizer industry. When the Levitt houses were built, uh, the homeowners were given instructions on how to keep a nice green lawn. And this, if you could see the bottom of where that advertisement says. You'll have a lawn the whole neighborhood will envy. So we're starting to see the beginnings of being green with envy of the, that one house on the block with a perfectly green lawn. But with lawn also came weeds. And namely, you know, one of them is dandelions. Um, there was a meme that came out a couple of years ago and I stopped promoting it a while ago. Uh, it said, leave the dandelions for early emerging bees. It's one of the first food sources. Uh, one of the reasons why I don't recommend that anymore, and this is me personally, um, I was reading a forum, a forum and then a man said, I was told to leave the dandelions for early emerging bees. I did, and now I hate the way that it looks. So I know that he was gonna now spend his time dousing that property in twice the amount of weed killer and fertilizer to get rid of those dandelions if he just did a little bit of maintenance in the beginning. Um, one of the things we wanna promote is early foraging, uh, blooming spring trees for those uh, early emerging bees. And I'm going to get that to that in a little while, but another thing we wanna address when it comes to lawn is crabgrass. This was another one that now we were applying more pesticide herbicides to kill another weed that was the bane of our existence. Plant blindness, the inability to see or notice the plants in one's own environment. Um, this is actually very true. A lot of people just leave their houses and they go to work without really looking at the environment, without really seeing what is on the open road in front of them, um, and not even knowing what kind of flora they have on their own property. So we want to kind of address this, and one of the best things I can recommend that you do is, oh, actually, let me, before I get to that, um, I wanted to discuss Norway maple. This was a tree that was introduced by a very well-known botanist in Philadelphia back in the 1750s. Uh, it's now become the number one shade tree in North America, which is kind of not right. I mean, why should we have a foreign tree as our number one shade tree for North America? This was brought in and promoted as a tree to plant out in pastures and town squares. Due to the propensity of the um, dense shade that it provides, it crowds out other native trees, it deprives them of sunlight, it deprives them of water, it's the first tree to leaf out and it's the last one to drop its leaves. And I know oak trees are the very last, but the extra headache that a Norway maple causes us is really just not fair when we don't wanna be cleaning the gutters back in December. So this is an American chestnut tree. This was the largest provider of food for wildlife. And then the, the chestnut blight hit and took out 4 billion chestnut trees. Now. What's kind of unusual about this tree is it produced a nut that was also edible for humans right out of the husk. And that the wood of the American chestnut tree wasn't prone to decay, so it was sought after for telephone poles. Now, 
This is a really interesting topic, and I hope it's one that maybe might intrigue you when you get more involved with, because there are groups here on Long Island that are trying to you know, bring back the, the chestnut tree. And if you're so inclined, you know, I can definitely uh, hook you up with some people if you're interested. So after the demise, oak trees, and hickory trees stepped up to become the next provider of food for wildlife. Blue jays are one of the best dispersers of acorns for oak trees. Um, there's been evidence of uh, blue jays dispersing oak trees up to seven miles away from the master parent plants. Usually they forget where they drop them, so most of them start to re-sprout as, as trees. Uh, this is the acorn wood, woodpecker that actually burrs, uh, burrows these holes into the trees and starts stuffing them with acorns. And of course, our old friend, the deer, filling up his belly with acorns. And our favorite guy, the squirrel, the one who raids everyone's bird feeders. That's why I'm a huge proponent of planting native to provide food so he's not going through your wallet and your bird feeder at the same time. So one of the best things that we can do is get educated on what are essential, you know, native trees. And this book is one of my favorites, Essential Native Trees and Shrubs for the Eastern United States. What's really cool about this book is it offers you companion plants to go with these trees. Go out and take a walk and bring a field guide with you. You're going to see a lot of trees out there. Um, this is a great resource to have on hand. Go visit Wertheim National Wildlife Refuge. There are plenty of other parks. There are, there are a lot of places to visit and they've really proven, open green space has proven its worth due to this recent uh, epidemic, uh, pandemic, excuse me. Uh, finally, the last book that I always recommend to people is Bringing Nature Home. This is the rallying cry of the native plant movement. This brought in the science of why these trees are so important to songbirds. It was a very intricate evolutionary process that these trees were going to be in bloom at the same time that insects were gonna be available to start eating their leaves and the same time that songbirds were gonna be migrating back to the Northeast to eat those insects to feed their young. So where do we get started? Well, if you need ideas, one of the best things that you can do for your landscape, and I borrowed this from uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy, um, work on the perimeter of your property. If you want to be ornamental, you can do so around the foundation of your own home. Um, luckily, a lot of the invasive species have been re removed from the market, you know, burning bush is kind of uh, gone, Japanese barberry. So think about what you can do on the outer edges of your property. Excuse me. So at the top of Dr. Ptolemy's list are the oak trees. These provide the highest amount of butterfly species, excuse me, to lay their eggs on. There's, there's so many insects up there in those treetops. There's little larvae, little caterpillars, little spiders, little wasps. There's all sorts of insects that those birds need to feed their young. So this is the white oak, and this is the other group of oak trees, the red oak. And I don't want you to think you're tied into the same kind of basic leaf shape where you're not going to think that, you know, no one knows what an oak tree is. This is the chestnut oak. This is part of the white group. And if you use your imagination, that, that leaf is very similar to the American chestnut. It's a great way to kind of bridge the past with a little bit of the future. Um, it's a wonderful, it's, you know, it's going to get very tall, it's going to get wide, and it's going to drop acorns. Another really interesting oak tree to think about from the red group are willow oaks. I really am captivated by this tree. Um, you can see a, very, a couple of fine examples of willow oaks down at Bayard Cutting Arboretum. Those leaves, when they fall, because they're not so big, they're really not a problem. They just kind of lay at the base of the tree, and over time, they just disintegrate, and next spring, they're, back, they're basically gone. I think that this is a very prized specimen for you to try on your property if you're so inclined. And by the way, I want to make sure you understand that um, any of these big tree suggestions are really based on what's relative to your own property size. I only have a quarter of an acre. What's really usable between you know, my driveway, my detached garage, my patio, I have actually very little lawn space to begin with, and I would love these trees, but I just can't put them, the big guys on my property like this. So I depend on my neighbor across the street who has two really beautiful examples of white oak trees. 
Um, I've watched them in every storm and they really just stand up. It's the mighty oak. The only problem with oak trees feeding wildlife is they're not reliable producers every year. They go through what's known as mast years. For some reason, and scientists still haven't figured this out unless there's a science person out there who does know this answer, a lot of oak trees will synchronize with other oak trees and not produce acorns. Sometimes they'll go through mast years where they drop acorns left and right, and then there are other times where they don't do anything at all. And that's part of a survival mechanism where you starve the predator one year and you, uh, you Feed them the one year and then you starve them the next. So if you are looking for wildlife trees, definitely give this a try. And I would suggest you not to plant them near a driveway, a patio, over your house, anywhere where it's gonna kind of, the acorns are kind of gonna fall and be a nuisance for you. This is pignut hickory. This is another um, very big tree. This is what I was talking about before with the other oak tree, how they became uh, suppliers of food for wildlife. And early colonials, hog farmers, you can see the little pig down here. Uh, the hog farmers realized their pigs love to eat these nuts and so they named this tree pig nut hickory. There's also another um, more popular, I would say, hickory called shagbark hickory. If you, you know, the dead giveaway is the shaggy nature of the bark. And in that bark, you're going to, there's a lot of little hidden crevices and nooks and crannies where insects are going to overwinter and become a source of food for woodpeckers. When I was doing some uh, research before in um, bringing nature home, Dr. Ptolemy said, if I could on my property, I would plant nothing, no, I should say nothing. He would plant hickories, oaks, and American beaches just for the amount of insects and songbirds that will uh, feast on them. If you want to satisfy your maple desire, I would suggest Acerubrum red maple. Um, this is not the full color all year long, you know, while it's in leaf. Um, don't be misguided either by um, Crimson King, which is a cultivar of the Norway maple. Uh, nor uh, red maple, this red color, unfortunately, is not standard for the species. It is up to the individual plant to produce this, you know, spectacular red show. If, if you are lucky enough to get a red maple that does, consider yourself lucky because it's really one of the most breathtaking things to see in the fall but it is very much a very desirable tree. Um, it supports a lot of insect life. Um, birds love to nest in it. Squirrels love to jump up, you know, run up and down it. And red maple is one of the most, um, it's one of the first trees to break dormancy. So if you're driving around and you see a maple that has a reddish hue on the tips, chances are it is a red maple. And if you get up close to it, you, the buds actually kind of resemble coronavirus, which was a really weird, coincidence this, for me to experience this winter when that was becoming an issue. So um, red maple is really a, a cool tree to have. And due to its survivability, it, is, it has the longest north-south range of any tree we have. Um, this is a tree, once you identify it, you'll see it everywhere. American linden, uh, known, or, or known as basswood, Tilia americana. This is a bee tree. It is a spring flowering tree. I mean, I don't think you really can really see it from uh, the ground view of it, but it has a pyramidal shape. It's um, spectacular when given lawn stat uh, yard status. So if you have space in your property to go for a basswood, I would encourage you to do so. And I wouldn't put anything underneath it because sometimes those insects create a honeydew that kind of affects anything growing underneath it. Um, I've shown this slide before, the native black cherry tree supports the life cycles of 456 moths, caterpillars, and butterflies, and 33 species of birds. Um, this is another important foraging tree for spring pollinators. It's cloaked in these beautiful white flowers. Um, my nose sometimes works and doesn't. I really have never really been able to uh, discern a fragrance off of this tree. Uh, some people consider black cherry to be a bit of a weed tree. Uh, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, I guess. If you can find a nice spot to tuck it in, please do so. It is worthy of being planted for its wildlife value. Um, another tree that I recommend is sweet birch. Um, the birches have been kind of hit hard with uh, climate change, whether that's something you believe in or not. I'm not here to fight you on that. But when I've spoken to a lot of my experts in this field, they said it's really not worth trying to plant white birch anymore. It's just not cold enough here for them. If you're intent on a white birch, it's beautiful. You can plant it, but you might lose it sooner than you think. 
a sweet birch might be a better choice for you. Now to go into the smaller ones. Um, Cornice, Florida, Eastern Flower and Dogwood. In my humble opinion, I think every property should have a dogwood or two or three, you know, put them in the right locations and you're gonna be enjoying these creamy white bracts every, every spring. Um, I think because of our, our cold, wet spring, this wasn't a great performance year for the dogwoods, but it's true powerhouse power, superpower lies in the red berries that come in the fall. I've seen birds fight over these berries. They're loaded with lipids and proteins that migrating songbirds need, and they're going to have to fight off the squirrels for them. It's a very special tree. I hope either you have one or you have room in your property for one. Uh, again, I've consulted my experts who said that dogwood and thracnose is not enough of a reason to not plant uh, dogwoods on your property. This is probably the nicest picture I found of dogwood in the fall. I, in my experience, I've never had leaf color this vibrant, but what I do like about the dogwoods is that they lose their leaves relatively quickly during the mowing season, so I don't have to do any raking. I'm lucky enough that they just fall and I mow them and I'm done with them. So I apologize for this picture. This is American hornbeam, Carpinus caroliniana. The one on the left was taken at Wertheim National Wildlife Refuge in Shirley. It was just starting to leaf out. So I culled this picture on the right from the internet just to give you a comparison shot of what it, what it would look like if, you know, when it's all fully leafed out. And um, it's a nice small tree. It's an understory tree. It's good for naturalizing or if you live at the forest edge of a woodland, it's, it's a nice addition to have. That tree has a lot of um, forked uh, crotches to it, which promote uh, birds wanting to nest in them. So it's a, it's a different tree to have. It's not very common in the home landscape. It might be something you might uh, be interested in. This I kind of consider a little cousin to him, um, the hop horn bean. The fruits of the, horn, of the hop horn bean res resemble the same hops that beer is made out of. And I was looking for pictures on the internet and I found a few that um, Designers use to anchor patios and uh, next to pools because it's, it's a nice little shade tree. It's not overpowering and could be something that interests you as well. Um, one of my favorite trees on Long Island, sassafras. This, uh, again, when I was trying to take photographs of everything, they were just starting to leaf out now. There was really nothing to show. So it's, this is another internet photograph. Sassafras tends to thicket. It is a really nice tree. If I had this in place of the Norway maples behind my house, I would be one ecstatic person. This is a, um, a leaf I took at Wertheim the other day. This is a very neat tree for having three different shaped leaves on one tree. You go from glove, mitten, to oval. It's the alternate host of the spice bush swallowtail. So you can see the little spice bush uh, caterpillars on here and they're trying to imitate little snakes so birds won't eat them. It makes these little droops in the fall, and here on the side here is a little chrysalis. Amelanchier, uh, service berry. I've seen a lot of service berry cultivars on the market. Usually you find them at the big box stores. They go under, you know, Rainbow Pillar, Autumn Brilliance, Appleberry. If you can find a straight up species, I think you'll be well rewarded. Um, if it's on a spring show, it's another spring uh, foraging bloomer for uh, those pollinators. And it makes a, a very delicious little blue uh, berry. And it's a very intense blueberry flavor to it. Again, you're going to fight the birds for it, but if you could find one, this is uh, Amelanchier canadensis. There's also Amelanchier arborea and lavis, but um, I think all three of them will fit the bill for you. It is not a terribly tall tree. So I was um, consulting with a friend of mine for suggestions about what to plant in my yard. And I gave her where I was thinking and the conditions and she suggested um, this viburnum, black haw viburnum, viburnum profunolone. I'm not gonna try that Latin one, I'm kind of flustered. Um, this is a great little tree uh, shrub to have. It's a nice um, escape tree from predators. It's a nesting tree and those white flowers are gonna give way to berries in the fall. Usually viburnum berries do require a touch of frost to uh, make the berries a little more palatable to birds at that point. Another viburnum to give a little consideration to is nanny berry. I wanted to mention the, these two viburnums. Um, when I first moved to my house, I 
did an assessment of the property. I had just kind of gone through the Cornell Master Gardener program. And I was trying to be very diligent about inspecting everything for invasive species and all sorts of things that were undesirable. So the first thing I did was I removed a burning bush and I replaced it with this uh, nanny berry viburnum. Not because I wanted to imitate the red color of the fall, but I wanted a very, I wanted a, tr a shrub that was going to provide food for wildlife. And so far this has fit the bill very nicely. So when it comes to removing an invasive species, I wouldn't suggest really duplicating what the, you know, the traits that that species has. Try something different, try something that is gonna be more fertile for your landscape. So this is Sweet Bay Magnolia. It is very rare in the wild anymore. Um, you can still find it in the nursery industry. This was a photograph that I called from the internet. This is definitely from the nursery field. It's got the irrigation under the lines. It's kind of pruned to have a certain shape to it. This is a semi-evergreen. It's gonna retain those leaves pretty much all year, lose them in the late winter and push out new growth. And it makes these white saucer cup flowers that have a lemony uh, fragrance to them. You can see mature specimens of these down at Bayard Cutting Arboretum. I personally feel that Ilex opaca, American holly, does not receive enough respect in the home landscape. Um, I, I don't know how, where do I count the ways with American holly? It is a very strong tree. Um, it was one of the few trees I saw on my property um, that stood up to the winds of Hurricane Sandy. It does produce those red berries, but it needs a male pollinator in the vicinity for the female to produce berries. And it's a great tree for uh, winter roosting, spring nesting. Every March, my friend who lives down in Patchogue has a really fantastic specimen on her property. She called me around St. Patrick's Day to tell me that a flock of robins have just landed in the holly tree and they're picking it clean. Um, those are very nutritious berries. And you know we don't want to think that you know, robins are out there just pulling up worms all the time. They're supplementing their diet with other things. And this is a berry tree that they are, they are looking for. Um, here's a stalwart of Long Island, the Eastern Red Cedar, Juniperus virginiana. This is one of my favorite trees. Um, you kind of tend to see it everywhere. There does have a sense of commonness about it. The berries are very highly sought after by birds. And you probably see them a lot along the roadways because birds are eating those berries. They're flying up to a telephone line, a, a stop sign, and they're pooping out a berry as you know, the seed lands and it grows where it lands. And it's a very vigorous uh, tree. If you live near an apple orchard, certainly please don't uh, plant it. It is the alternate host for cedar apple rust. And um, I just went through a bout with the cold rainy spring that we just had. And eventually it just kind of worked itself out and went away on its own with, this, with the Eastern Red Cedar, I mean. Now talking about plant blindness, um, this is an Eastern Red Cedar. Um, this is what my friend calls the Lorax tree at Avalon Park in Stony Brook. She can't walk by without hugging it. And, you know, when you go out to a park, you want to say, hey, what is that tree? It's an Eastern Red Cedar. Well, I have one on my property. Maybe it will look like that someday. You want to start addressing your plant blindness now so you know what's what when you go out into the wilderness. Um, one of the cool things about this little Stonehenge area that they created, I love the way that the staghorn sumac frames or matches up against that Eastern Red Cedar. They're very complementary to plant near each other. So I spoke a lot about trees that you can plant and I wanna address one less tree that we probably never think about. Oh, actually, I'll get to that one next. I wanna mention this guy. This is the Scarlet Tanager. Um, a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine in Brooklyn grabbed his binoculars and went out and did some birding and he found a Scarlet Tanager in a park. I was lucky enough to see um, two scarlet tanagers fly by my house a couple of years ago, and they were chasing a female. Uh, this is one of those birds that when you see in real life, it just knocks your socks off. The, that brilliant red plumage with the black wing bars and the black tail just stops you in your tracks and you just think, wow. If you're a birder and you see this, you're thrilled. If you're a common backyard bird enthusiast, I mean, consider this a gift from God because it is really a very special thing to see. And this is kind of what native plants and trees are doing for our wildlife. Um, now they're kind of passing through, they have very specific nesting sites that they're looking for. And once they kind of get where they want to go, 
they're way up in those treetops. They're picking off insects left and right, feeding a brood of, um, of little babies in there. So another Facebook page that I follow, they were also seeing scarlet tanagers. So apparently they're on the move and they're being, um, you know, a very secretive bird is being photographed and, and, and observed. And I thought one of the interesting things about what they said was, this is a bird that is seeking out three types of trees where it does its best. Sugar maple, Amer uh, American beech, and birch trees. And I think we can kind of sit back or, you know, just kind of think about that, or what we're putting on our property and how that matters. Now, I'm not going to say you, you planted those three trees and you're going to come find me and want to kick my butt because these birds didn't show up in your backyard. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying just give these guys an area to kind of feel safe and let them land on your property. They're probably just going to pass through. But it's, a, it's one of those nature experiences that you really do kind of enjoy in the end. So this was the last tree that I wanted to mention. A dead tree. If you have a space on your property where a tree has died and it can safely remain intact for as long as it needs to without causing harm to you know, a human being, a car, a structure, or whatever, there's a lot of life in that tree. You know, a lot of life is still giving out of dead wood. It's creating home for birds. It's creating insects that are going to burrow into that wood. There's frogs and toads and salamanders. There's just too much good stuff that comes out of a dead tree for you to just get rid of it too fast. Um, how long you want to leave a dead tree up for is completely up to you. I'll be very honest with you. I had a dead. I have a dead tree in my backyard, part of the Nori Maples, one of them that split in half during Hurricane Sandy. Um, Twelve years. Uh, 2012, 28 years coming up on Hurricane Sandy. I think I've, I'm kind of done looking at a dead tree. So I'm going to remove mine and just be grateful for the extra lifespan that it had given me. So with all that said, I'm hoping that you will plant something. I'm hoping that it will be native. I'm hoping something that will do double duty is to give you, give birds a berry, an insect, give you a flower, give you a fragrance, give you something to really enjoy your property with. So. That is all I have to offer you tonight. Brian, thank you so much. And yes, what a great message about dead trees that they're filled with life. Thank you.